Hey, Joel. Wow. Mike's really hot, so you can dial me back. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Good morning. Our missions conference continues today, and uh, it is my privilege to speak a little bit this morning. Uh, I heard that there was a fantastic day yesterday, and I'm sorry I couldn't make it. I had to take out somebody's appendix or something like that. So <laughs> anyways, let me, uh, let me ask God for help. And we'll dive right in. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you reach down and save sinners like me. Thank you that you go out on a rescue mission at great cost to yourself and that you lead us as your bride in continuing that rescue mission so that more can see and savor how sweet you are. I pray that this morning you would be present and that your spirit would breathe into us a new, fresh urgency and passion. I ask this in your precious name. Amen. This is a message that I had the opportunity to share in our missions Sunday school class. So I apologize in advance for any of you who have already heard this. Um, hopefully today makes more sense. I was recovering from a head injury when I last gave this, so maybe, maybe I can uh, piece together my thoughts a bit more cogently. At the time, I brought in a, a jar of mustard seeds and passed it around. I won't be doing that this time, but if you can imagine, mustard seeds are extremely small, and I didn't bother bringing them today because if I held it up here, you wouldn't see anything. It's even smaller than a sesame seed. And yet Jesus spoke of this, and I, he did so as an analogy for his kingdom, which is why I think it is appropriate to repeat Jesus' analogy for us. Uh, the topic is that we are the commissioned church, and during this missions conference, our emphasis has been on how can we live missionally, how can we multiply locally, and how can we impact globally. So this morning, as I share, my hope is that we as a church can receive from Jesus this instruction on how we can impact the entire world. And it starts with something as small as a mustard seed. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Let's unpack that this morning. I didn't have mustard seeds growing up, but what I did have back in Washington State were blackberry bushes. Now, oftentimes, my kids will come grocery shopping and say, oh, oh, Dad, I see blackberries. Can we, can we get a carton? And I'm like, no. No, you cannot get a carton of blackberries. They're like this big, and it costs more than a gallon of gasoline. I used to get those for free where I was growing up. I, I can't imagine paying that. You're going to bankrupt me. Um, Blackberry bushes grew wild, so wild, so prevalent, that there were billboards advertising blackberry removal because people couldn't get rid of the things in Washington State. They just kept multiplying and spreading. And when Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, I think of those blackberry bushes which are multiplying and spreading, and in the same way, our church, the bride of Christ, should be thriving and multiplying to the degree that Satan wishes he could call somebody and say, hey, do you have a church removal service? Because these guys are flooding me. So this is what we want to be, growing and spreading to the glory of Christ. And he said we start like a mustard seed. We start small. 
But when you plant a seed, certain things begin to happen in a certain order. First, that seed will put down its roots. And then the seed will grow up. The plant will start to spread out and even multiply. Then it provides cover and shelter. And then through that plant, more nutrition, more sap, more life can flow. And that is what we're going to explore today, how we as a church can be growing down, putting down roots into Christ, and growing up into our head, Jesus, and how we can spread out and multiply locally and globally, how we can provide cover and shelter for the lost and for our missionaries on the front lines, and how through us, Christ intends to send his spirit, to flow his resources so that we can have an impact. So our first area of growth is growing down. Jesus told another agricultural parable about a man who went out with seed to sow. And some of the seed fell on rocky soil and was snatched up by birds right away and nothing came of it. But other seed fell on some thin soil and it sprouted quickly. But it didn't have roots. And as you may recall, when the sun came up, those plants withered. In contrast, in my backyard, uh, we bought a, an old house. It's almost as old as I am. And the man who had built that house, he kept receipts on everything. So when we're digging through his receipts, we see a receipt for three yucca plants. Once upon a time, he paid good money to have yucca plants put down in, in the backyard. Well, I'll tell you, by the time we bought the house, there were a lot more than three yucca plants growing back there. They have uh, established themselves and multiplied vigorously, and it doesn't matter if you don't water them. They don't care because they're really hardy. In fact, what they have going for them is a tap root that goes deep, 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 six, eight, ten feet into the ground. And you can't just pull up a yucca plant. You might need like industrial construction equipment to yank these things out of the ground. I'm certainly not going to go at it with a shovel. That's not happening. But these yuccas can thrive even in our harsh and dry Colorado environment because they have a deep root. And Jesus wants us to be rooted in him. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, we're told... Therefore, as you have received Christ, just as you were taught, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. We need to put down these roots. If we're going to grow up in him, first we need to grow down and get connected, get rooted, be implanted into this source of life, of guidance, of nutrition, of, of spirit. But how do we do that? How practically can we as a church be rooted in Christ and be so strongly and intimately connected that nothing can sever us, that we will always be fed by Christ despite the harshest drought, despite the toughest conditions, we'll always have that resource well, Jesus said it's a matter of abiding. He's like a vine, and we're like a branch that is connected to that vine. He said in John chapter 15 that he is the true vine. If, I, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Just like those yucca plants in my backyard can keep growing, can keep thriving because they know they have a root that can keep bringing up more water, more nutrition. We can live, we can thrive if we are abiding in Jesus, if we have ourselves connected to him and his words, his truth can keep flowing up into us and nourishing us. So let me ask you this. How's your abiding going? How is your connection with Christ going? Are you meditating on the Word of God? Do you memorize the Word of God? Going all the way back 
the very first psalm. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Meditating day and night on God's word, ruminating on it, just mulling it over. I'm going to read it. I'm going to think of it. I'm going to read slowly. That's what Pastor Gold talked about during the Q&A on Friday night. He has found that if he doesn't take the time to slow down and read the Bible meditatively, he's not nourished, and then he has nothing to give to his church. And we, as the Bride of Christ, are no exception. We are all called to be so saturated with God's Word that it permeates all of our thinking and all of our actions, and it just flows out of us. How else can we abide in Christ then? If, if we're filling ourselves up with his word, what, what flows out of that next? Jesus said, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And tying that back to the Colossians 2, 6 passage earlier that I read, Therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Once we're rooted in him, there should be this natural response, this, this action that flows out of it. Because when his spirit, when his life starts flowing up to us through that connection, then we're influenced, we're changed, we're carried along by this new power, this new living spirit. And so it will affect how we walk. It will affect what we do. We'll have a new desire, a new appetite to obey God's word and to follow his commandments. We'll follow his leading. I'll close with an example from the early church. There were a group of men sitting around, but not just sitting around. They were fasting and praying they were worshiping and doing more fasting. And in the context of this, God did something. God started something. These men were rooted in God, and out of that, something transformational occurred. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Paul's first missionary journey, this first chance to radically impact the world and to bring the gospel into uncharted territory, started out with a group of men who were rooted in Christ, who were meditating on his word, who were connected and fasting and worshiping and praying. The commissioned church must first be rooted, and then afterwards, the growing up and the going out can occur. So that's my first point. Put your roots down into Jesus Christ. Next, we're going to talk about growing up in Christ. And I will give you both a negative example and a positive example from Scripture. The negative example, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Here's Paul writing to the church at Corinth and saying, you should have grown up more by now. You should be ready to handle solid food. I've got a six-year-old. Thankfully, he's not running around in the back. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to hear anything. But when we first uh, fostered him, he was a baby who needed milk. But he's not still on formula which is really good because it's expensive. No, now he's on everything else, which is even more expensive, but he has grown up. 
We are to grow up. This is natural. If you throw a seed in the ground, it's not just going to stay there. It's going to germinate, put down roots, and then, boom, send something up. Because unless it does, it's not going to get any more nutrients from the sun. Now, let's flip from the negative to the positive. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's from Ephesians 4. So there's our positive contrast to the lack of growth in Corinth. We are to be joined together with every part, causing the body to grow up to our head, Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that Paul uses the term joints, every joint with which it is equipped, because a joint represents an intersection between two very different body parts. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if this analogy is good, but when I was in the OR, and I was looking down, my eye saw something. Oh, well, there's this spot on the patient's body. It's kind of deep. I'm going to have to operate on that. And my brain recognized what my eye was seeing, and my hand heard what my brain was saying for it to do. And then, boop, 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 move my suture around, throw a stitch. Okay, problem solved. It's every single different body part doing what it does best, but doing it together. This is how our unique and diverse body of believers can accomplish a common goal in Christ when we are joined together, when we are growing together. Uh, maybe a better analogy, and it's another plant analogy. You're going to be sick of plants by the time this is done. But let's, let's look at the roots. The roots can say, oh, well, I did all the hard work. I sucked up all the nutrients out of the ground. You're welcome, plant. And the leaf can say, oh, not so fast there, roots. We had a job, too, here. Um, if we weren't evaporating some of the moisture through our leaves, we wouldn't be pulling up those nutrients out of the ground, out of the, out of the roots, and causing it to move through. And then the, the, the stem or the trunk can say, hey, guys, neither of you would be anything without me because I connect you and support you. The point is, there are parts of the plant that are completely different than any other part of the plant. And yet, n no individual section can say, I'm all there is. Without me, it's, you know, you, I, I make the plant. Every single one of us, we have a role to play. And we aren't the be all and end all. Christ is. And so, when we take what he's given us, when we take the unique gift that he's placed in you, and in you, and in you, and in me, and we join ourselves together, then finally, when we're together, we can accomplish something. Individually, we can accomplish nothing. We need each part of the body. It's not just about the missionary. It's not just about the elder. It's not just about the one who prays or prophesies or the one who heals or gives hospitality. Each member of the body is essential as we grow up into Christ. Going back to the negative example, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, they were rebuked for jealousy and strife. He said they were being of the flesh and behaving in a human way. It was this lack of cooperation between the body parts that Paul was saying, no, that's of the flesh. That is not of the spirit of Christ. You are not living and growing up towards our head in unity. In contrast, Paul writes to the Ephesians, that is not the way you learned Christ. You are to put off the old self and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So let me ask you this. Which one are you? Which aspect Will you feed and nourish? 
Will it be your flesh, which by nature wants to promote strife and conflict and selfishness? Or will it be the spirit that is created after the likeness of God, a spirit that is holy and able to work together for the common purpose that God has set us apart for? Because you're going to grow one or the other. You're going to grow your flesh or you're going to grow your spirit. It just depends on which one you feed, which one you nourish. There are certain parts of our body that are so metabolically active that they need more blood flow than other parts of our body. Even just now, sitting here, being put to sleep by me, your brain is consuming between 15 and 20% of every drop of blood your heart is pumping out. Constantly. Every single heartbeat. A fifth of it's going straight to your brain and nowhere else. Because those neurons firing need a constant supply of nutrition. Likewise, your kidneys are siphoning off a quarter of your blood flow. Your kidneys weigh less than a pound combined. And yet, in your average 140-pound body, they are sucking up one out of every four drops of blood in your entire body because they need it. So I'm telling you, if you are active and alive and feeding your spirit on the Word of God and letting Him lead you spiritually instead of the flesh, which just wants to fight for itself, then you will grow and nourish the active and living part of the body of Christ in you. And that is what will thrive. You've got to decide what will you be led by? What will you feed? How will you act? I'll wrap this up with Colossians 2.7. Built up in him and established in the faith, abounding in thanksgiving. As we grow, as we are built up in Christ, there should be thanksgiving, thanksgiving, thanksgiving flowing out of us. It's not just a holiday in November. It is the response that we can't help but make when we see Christ growing his church in and through us. Why should we give so much thanks? He even commanded it way back in the book of Deuteronomy. He said, someday you're going to be living in houses you didn't build. You're going to be drinking from cisterns you didn't dig up. You're going to be reaping from vineyards you didn't plant. Be thankful. Otherwise, you're going to think that you did this yourself. Our thankfulness reminds us that it's God, not us. He gets the glory. He gets the credit, not us. When we look at all the growth of the church throughout history, all we can say is, it's God, it's not us. Give thanks to keep your mind clear on that fact. And in Luke 17, he has this parable where a, a master comes home to his house and he commands his servants to prepare him a meal. And afterwards, the servants say, we are just unworthy servants. And when we give thanks like that, we acknowledge to Jesus, I got to serve you. And I'm just an unworthy servant. Thank you so much, Lord. So the commissioned church is built up as its diverse members work together and grow together and give thanks together. So first, we have put our roots down into Christ. We have grown up towards Christ and in unity. And next, we are to spread out. If I threw that mustard seed in the ground, I would not get a bottle of French's mustard the next day. It doesn't happen like that. You don't instantly get fruit. If you want the results, you first need to see that plant put down roots, then you need to see that plant grow up, and then it can produce fruit. It can multiply. And what's the big deal about multiplying? whoop de doo um, It's kind of the whole point. Jesus told a pretty harsh parable. He told a lot of parables, but this one really <clears throat> digs you in the side. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. 
And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And in case we've forgotten, in John 15, he said something similar. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, the Father prunes. God has always been seeking multiplication. There is one command that he gave to both Adam and to Noah, word for word. Be fruitful and multiply. Which is eyebrow raising because just before the flood, people had multiplied. The world was full. There were lots and lots of people. So why wipe them all out and tell them to multiply? They'd already checked that box, God. No, they hadn't. Because it's not enough just to make numbers. It's not enough just to have 7 billion people on planet Earth. God wants a specific group of people. Malachi chapter 2, did he not make them one? And he's talking about a husband and wife. Did he not make them one with a portion of his spirit in their union? And what was God seeking? Godly offspring. He doesn't want us to just multiply. He wants us to multiply disciples. He wants us to produce godly offspring, the next generation and the next generation, more numerous but just as faithful to him. He is wanting a people that will follow him. So no, seven billion people on earth doesn't check the box. He wants the church going forth and being this rock that he has built his church upon, that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. It is a battle. It is retaking the lost for the glory of God so that he has this godly offspring that he's been looking for. I shared this in the Sunday school class, and it sounded goofy then, and it still sounds goofy now, but I have to share it because it is the cry of my heart. In Genesis 30... Jacob has married Leah and Rachel, and Leah has had three or four sons by this point, and Rachel has had zero. And she's getting desperate. And she cries out, Give me children or I'll die. And this is the prayer of my heart, and I pray that it is your prayer that you are so zealous, so passionate that you cry out to Jesus more than Rachel cried out to Jacob, give me spiritual children. Help me multiply. Make me fruitful. I don't want to just be a happy, holy little Christian plugged into you and go to church on Sundays. I want to be fruitful. It's not enough, God. Your blessings, your sweetness, all that you rain down on me, all that you flow through me, all that you bless me with, I'm not satisfied until that results in fruit, until I see more souls brought in experiencing your sweetness and joining me in worshiping you because you're that good and I want more people to know you. Give me children or I'll die. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. How much is much fruit? When Jesus told that parable of sowing seed on different kinds of soil, he said some of that seed fell on good soil and it Indeed, bears fruit and yields. In one case, a hundredfold. In another, 60. And in another, 30. Can you imagine if your stock portfolio had a 100-fold return? It's mind-blowing. There is an example of Isaac in the book of Genesis where he went out and planted. And in a year, 
one year reaped a hundredfold. This is God's miraculous, mind-blowing, unbelievable, humongous, fruit-producing power, and he wants to put it in you. That's the degree to which we are to beseech the Lord of the harvest. Please produce this hundredfold harvest, not for my glory, but for yours. God supplies the power to produce that fruit. In Acts 1.8, Jesus is giving his last instructions as he ascends into heaven. And you think, okay, I got to get my notebook out. I'm going to write down everything he says to do. I'm going to go do it. What is it, God? What do you want me to go do right now? He says, wait. Wait? Yes, wait. Wait until I send the power. You will be clothed with power from the Holy Spirit. And then you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Our eagerness to produce fruit, our eagerness to multiply for God is predicated upon him sending the power first. So we won't produce fruit until he sends the power, and we have to ask him for that. 2 Corinthians 9, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Everything that we hope to accomplish, all the fruitfulness that we dream of happening, all of the rescue plan that we are eager to see unfold, is rooted in God supplying the seed and multiplying the harvest. We can't do it unless he first sends the power. And my final verse that I'll hit you with on this topic, it's so beautiful. It's our Savior's heart. You can just feel his compassion as you hear this. When he saw the crowds... He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We are to spread out We, the commissioned church, are to go out. We are to multiply and reproduce. And the commissioned church depends on Jesus for the seed to sow, the power to bear, and the laborers to harvest. Fruit. We spread out and grow for his glory. So the commissioned church is rooted down in Christ. It is growing up toward Christ. It is spreading out for Christ. And next point is that the commissioned church is to cover over and protect. Back to that analogy of the mustard seed. Jesus said, when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Ask yourself, is our church a place of refuge for the lost, where they can come and be safe? Is our church a place of hospitality and refreshment for the missionary so that when these weary frontline soldiers come back for a brief furlough, they can be restored and sheltered under us? Are we covering over and protecting? There was a time when I was in Afghanistan, that uh, we went outside the wire. We knew of an area where the enemy was operating a series of illegal checkpoints. It was oppressive to the people, and it was profitable to the Taliban, and it allowed them to continue their war fighting efforts. So we knew that 
for the sake of the war, these illegal checkpoints, this enemy stronghold throughout this valley would have to be uprooted. And they weren't going to go without a fight. So we traveled in armored vehicles in a convoy. Uh, I was part of a surgical team to uh, provide emergency trauma care in case our soldiers were hurt, because this was happening so far, so remote out there, that even with helicopters, they could not be flown to a hospital in time in Afghanistan if they were injured. So here we are, plodding our way through in this convoy of armored vehicles and supporting this mission. And it's approaching nighttime. So the decision was made to enter into an empty government building. It was still under construction. It was in one of these remote provinces of Afghanistan. And we park our armored cars and we go inside this empty shell of a building. It's a couple stories high. We're surrounded by the cities of this province, the, the buildings and people. And night falls. And sure enough, the enemy knows we're there. And through night vision, our snipers can see them gathering, surrounding, and approaching our building. Not sure how many we're dealing with here, but we know it's going to be a long night. So the captain radios back, and several miles away, the military has its artillery. And in the dark of night, they start firing from miles and miles away, illumination rounds, artillery shells that are filled with white phosphorus that will burn bright as the sun, and parachutes to allow them to come down slowly. So these shells would be fired from miles back and arrive at our location, explode, and rain down slowly, lighting up the landscape, shedding this bright white light over the ground and illuminating the enemy positions and scaring them off and providing us with a chance to spot our enemy and be protected, giving our snipers a chance to fight back. And I share this analogy because we as the church can be providing the same cover and protection over those who are out there in the battlefield, surrounded by the forces of darkness who would like nothing better than to hang on to their stronghold of evil and to destroy and snuff out anyone who would dare bring light into their turf. And how do we do that? How do we send out that artillery? And I tell you, it is through prayer. The commissioned church needs to be praying. Paul was asking for it over and over during his missionary journeys, during his letters. For example, in Romans 15, he was praying, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, I appeal to you to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Strive with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from unbelievers in Judea. He was radioing in a request for artillery. He was saying, I need you to strive. I need you to pray because there are unbelievers in Judea who would like nothing better than to shut me up once and for all and to stop the gospel. We are to pray. We are to pray for protection. We are to pray for unity. When I receive email updates from some different missionaries and doctors that I support, unity is a repeated request for prayer. It is so easy on the missions field for little annoyances and frictions and disagreements and squabbles to start to chisel apart the team and cause strife and lack of unity and lack of effectiveness. We're to put on these compassionate hearts, meekness, patience, harmony, like it says in Colossians 3, but it doesn't come naturally. We've got our flesh and we've got our spirit. Which one are you going to feed? 
We've got to be praying for the unity of our missionaries. Even Paul was saying, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree. That was in the letter to the Philippians. That letter is a big warm hug. That letter is nothing but positive stuff. But even then, he's like, uh, there is something you guys could be doing better. You could be getting along better. And to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, he exhorts them to forgive and comfort the one who hurt them, quote, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. I'll say that again. He's all about unity. Why? So that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. There is a satanic scheme, strategy, ploy to wreck the church through disagreement and strife. And God says, you know his MO. You know he's doing this. So pray for unity. So those are a couple defensive prayers we can lob out there, but there are also offensive prayers that we can be praying. We can pray for effectiveness. I had the uh, opportunity when I was a teenager to participate in Operation Good News. It was a evangelistic outreach training week that happened in San Jose, California. So I hopped in a minivan with my youth group leader and other people from the high school youth group. We drove down to San Jose, and for a week, we received all kinds of training in evangelism and were sent out on the streets to the malls. We even held an outreach event at the end of it. And something unique occurred during that week. I've had opportunities to do evangelism since then, including with uh, Rick Hallahan and Micah Davis here at church. And I'll tell you, during that time in San Jose, there was something going on. Because the hearts of the people were strangely receptive. You could walk up to a stranger and, and it was like the fruit was just hanging, ready to, to harvest. Like, what is going on here? This is, this is spiritually special. And what I learned was Billy Graham was planning to hold a crusade in that area in a month or two. And so, people around the country and around the world had been praying for San Jose, had been praying for God's spirit to soften hearts there. And I was witnessing that. I was getting to see, uh, boots on the ground, the results of those prayers being lobbed in from all across the world. So we can pray for effectiveness 2 Thessalonians, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. Paul was asking for prayer so that when he does preach, the word will go out quickly and be honored, that people will have ears to hear and eyes to see and understand the gospel. We can also pray for God to give the light of knowledge because, quote, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We can be praying against that blindness. The God of this age, Satan, is preventing people from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. He's put blinders on them. So we can go on the offense and say, no, God, don't let that man go blind and die. God, I pray that you would open his eyes and let him see. If you can cause the scales to fall off of Paul's eyes, if you can heal a man blind from birth, you can do this, God. I pray that you would reveal your light. Other ways we can pray offensively. Jesus said, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides the spoil. Jesus is the stronger one. Yes, we have a roaring lion prowling about, 
seeking someone to devour. He's well armed, and he guards his spoil. He guards the people that he thinks are his. But we can pray for God to overcome him, to take away Satan's armor in which he trusted, and to divide his spoil. Ephesians 4 said that Jesus leads in his train captives. He is rescuing the captives, and it's like he is in a celebration march, a victory march, walking through the streets, ticker tape parade, and behind him, all these captives that he's rescued out from Satan's stronghold. So that's what we're praying for. We're praying for God to save sinners, to bind the enemy, to unblind the lost, to give effectiveness to the preaching so that it speeds forth and is honored. And finally, we can pray against the invisible spiritual opposition. Because as we learn when we learn about the armor of God, our our war is not against flesh and blood. It is against principalities and powers and anything that raises itself up against the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. An example from the book of Daniel. He has been reading the prophecies of Jeremiah. And he is a very well-educated, very wise man. He recognizes it's time. These prophecies, they're, they're due to come true now. The time to restore the exiles is now. And instead of just sitting back and saying, all right, okay, God, any second now, I'm ready, he starts fasting and praying intensely. He is praying for God to fulfill his word. And an angel shows up. Gabriel comes to Daniel and speaks to him. Behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand up, right? For now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up, trembling. And then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words, his prayers, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For 21 days, the archangel Gabriel was being opposed. He was sent by God to bring and unfold this vision to Daniel, but the prince of Persia, the enemy spiritual forces, were preventing this messenger of God from being able to deliver the spiritual truth to Daniel, which ultimately blesses all of us. 21 days of spiritual battle until Michael comes and helps Gabriel, and then Gabriel's able to get through with the message. And the reason I share this with you is that Daniel was obedient. Daniel was praying. Daniel was doing everything he was supposed to. He didn't even know how serious this spiritual battle was or why it was taking so long to get an answer. And if Daniel, a man of wisdom, a man who lived through not just generations of kings, but entire civilizations, the fall of Babylon and the rise of Persia, if Daniel couldn't fully grasp the spiritual battle, how much more should we be humbly praying and saying, God, I don't have a clue what's going on out there spiritually, but you do, and I just pray whatever you want to accomplish, I pray that you will overpower the spirit of this age, the powers of darkness, the principalities that dare to raise a fist against you and stop the advance of your kingdom. We need to pray offensively. The commissioned church spreads over the missionaries and the lost praying for protection and salvation. We're growing down with roots. We're growing up toward Christ. We're multiplying out. We're covering over. And finally, my final point, God is going to work through us. 
one of my favorite fruits is strawberries. And the funny thing about strawberry plants is how they reproduce. Does anyone know how you get new strawberry plants? You think you just throw some strawberry seeds in the ground? No. Strawberries send out runners. They send out these horizontal stems or, or branches. And then that runner grows, 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 grows into the ground some distance off. And then a new strawberry plant starts growing up there. And a new strawberry plant starts growing up there. And through these runners, the original plant is sending out its own nutrition, its own nutrients, its own sugars that it's made through photosynthesis, its own sap that is drawn up through the ground. It is nourishing a new church plant, if you will, by giving up of itself and letting things flow through it. As much as we want to plant multiple churches around the world and see new outposts spring up, the fact is there will be a need for God to send resources through us to use us, even sacrificially, so that these new plants can become established. We talk a lot about tent making. For those of you who are new to the term, it goes back to the book of Acts, where Paul is described as being in a particular city on his missionary journey. He wants to evangelize. And in order to keep himself fed, he does a side gig. He makes tents and sells the tents so that he has money to buy food and keep preaching the gospel. So we call that tent making when we have a missionary go out and be on the mission field, but also do a side gig so that they can uh, support themselves financially. And it's not always possible. Family I6 Alpha could not tent make. They had a plan to. Uh, he has skills and so forth, but the political corruption, the economic climate, the nature of the area made it impossible to tent make. So for this family to be on the front lines proclaiming the gospel, they need an ongoing lifeline of support. They need stuff to flow through us to them so that they can keep sharing the gospel. Paul gives an example of a church that did that for him. Again, it's the book of Philippians, the great big hug. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you. You only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Paul was blessed by this church that said, yes, God, flow through us. You've given us all these resources. Let us send them out to Paul so that he can keep proclaiming it. Likewise, in Romans 15, he's written this beautiful letter to the Romans. And he says, I hope to see you. He's never actually met this church. His plan is to go all the way to Spain and bring the gospel. So he says, I, I hope to see you on my way there as I go to Spain. And to be helped on my journey there by you. The church can be giving its resources so that new church plants, new gospel pioneer work can happen. And likewise in 2 Corinthians 8, the Macedonians had been giving so sacrificially. We want you to know, brothers, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Do you have that heart? Are you giving yourself? Giving yourself to the Lord first and saying, whoever, wherever, whatever the need, God, if it's in my hand, it's for your cause. There's another way that God flows through us, and that is not just for the practical and financial and physical support, but also a spiritual encouragement and guidance. 
Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, you, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Three words. Feed my sheep. Tend my flock. He wanted his disciples to be people who are taking care spiritually, nourishing and supporting the young believers. There is something that God wants to flow through you. Did you know that in your eye, the lens, the lens of each eye, was produced by millions of tiny cells while you were developing in your mother's womb? They multiplied, and then they produced the lens material and stitched it all together. And then before you were born, those millions of cells died. They had to die. If those cells stuck around, you'd be blind because the light couldn't get in. They had to do their hardest to produce a lens and then die and disappear so that the light could shine through. The opposite is a cell that refuses to die, a cell that insists on taking every drop of nutrition it can and multiplying as fast as it can and doesn't care about its neighbors. We call that cancer. So which are you? God wants to shine the light of Christ through us. And if we aren't willing to give 100%, up to and including dying, that we're blocking the light. We're getting in the way. We're siphoning off the nutrients to ourselves like a clump of cancer. In Galatians 4, Christ, Paul is saying, little children for whom I am again in anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Can you hear that passion, that zeal for Whatever it takes, I am just in anguish because 110%. I want Christ to flow through me into you and produce himself in you. That is the kind of life-giving flow we are to have and exemplify. I'm debating how much more to talk, so, all right. I'm, I'm really close. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Another way that God can flow through us and nourish is, is through spiritual correction. Every cell in your body should have the exact same copy of DNA. Built into the machinery of our cells, this beautiful microscopic artwork, God has created specific protein molecules whose only job is to check the DNA strands and make corrections when a photocopy, a copy of the DNA, has been made incorrectly. And in fact, our immune system is supposed to recognize and destroy any cell that doesn't have the right copy of DNA. It's working wrong, it's cancer. Paul wrote that after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, set before them the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had run in vain. Paul wanted to make sure hey guys, um, check my theology here. I've, I've been preaching this. I want to make sure I'm saying it right, that I'm getting the correct truth, the gospel out there accurately. I don't want to have a wrong copy of the DNA and have churches everywhere with false teaching in them. Paul, over and over, has been writing to help the church stay correct in its doctrine. He wrote to the Galatians about their error in believing that circumcision could save them. He wrote to the Colossians to rebuke them for this false quest for some secret knowledge. 
He wrote to the Thessalonians to arouse them from their apathy. He wrote to the Corinthians to stop this internal strife. God can flow through us his truth to help correct the growth of the church, to keep it on track, to keep it in the right direction. There will be work that happens locally and work that happens in the pioneer fields. In Romans 15, 14, Paul said, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. So locally, we can be instructing one another. We can be equipped, filled with knowledge from God, and able to help keep one another spurred on in the truth and in correct teaching. Likewise, in the same chapter, Paul says, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. We have a local job of instructing one another, and we have a global call so that those who have never heard can also receive the exact same truth. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. Instruct or bring the Gentiles to obedience. Uh, this word means to admonish, to warn, to, to counsel. It's often used a warning against wrong conduct. The commissioned church lives sacrificially, letting Christ work through her to support, to instruct, to nurture, and to correct. That is what God will flow through us. So let's bring it all home. What happens if we are rooted down in Christ? Christ is glorified as the true vine, as our source of life. What is the result of us growing up in Christ? Christ is glorified as the head and builder of his church. What is the result of us spreading out, of bearing fruit? Christ is glorified as the Lord of the harvest who supplies seed to sow and causes the fruit to grow. And what is the result of us covering and laboring over new disciples? Christ is glorified as the defender of his servants and the light of God to the lost. And what is the result of us sacrificially letting God's spiritual and physical resources flow through us? Christ is glorified as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the spring of the water of life. This is my exhortation to us, the commissioned church. This is the mission God has us on, and this is the means by which God will accomplish that. I'm going to pray for us now, and I'm going to pray a very old prayer. This is from the year 1577. It is attributed to the English naval captain, Sir Francis Drake. And I'm going to pray this prayer today because... I think we need it. 500 years later, we need it. Because of our prosperity, maybe because of our complacency or even apathy. Church, please join with me in prayer. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves. When our dreams have come true, because we have dreamed too little. When we arrived safely, because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, O oh Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly to venture on wider seas 
where storms will show your mastery, where losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push into the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.